Turf, lawn, seed, grass, ground cover, right? What is it about that patch of green something? For all you lawn haters, before you <laughs> jump into the comment section, I fully understand and appreciate that more money, time, and energy has probably been dumped into this piece of landscaping than all of the other pieces combined. And, and that hurts um, because we have serious water problems on this planet. I grew up in the woods and my dad was an organic gardener and we were surrounded by, you know, a couple people with meticulous lawns who resented the fact that our leaves blew into their yard. Let's take one second to go back to that postcard in step four of the lands of the snow-capped mountains and the foothills and the church steeple and then the, what? The lime green fields. Grass will establish itself much more successfully in soil that has been fully aerated. Soil aeration, it's one of those words that sounds like it needs no explanation and to an extent it may not. Um, it does mean what it sounds like. I mean, we need to get air in the soil, okay? So uh, it is a, it's a turf term, a turf uh, people. <laughs> people who maintain uh, lawns, big lawns, uh, golf courses, or you know any number of, of the millions and millions of lawns out there. There's many people who just, that's all they do. I'm not one of them, but I do understand uh, and appreciate what it means. So let me tell you, soil aeration, it does affect you even in a small garden, if you're gonna do a patch of grass. Um, and it's actually a pretty common uh, uh, requirement for smaller yards because they're highly trafficked. And in fact, the grass or the, uh, the, the soil, the existing soil gets really compacted. Uh, it, when you, in order to identify whether or not you need this, probably the simplest, simplest explanation is to just take a shovel full or trowel full. If it feels kind of hard, first off, just to get your trowel in there, that's one, one consideration. The other is that there's kind of a silt uh, quality to the soil. It has a kind of a granular feel to it. Uh, and then when it does, it, usually there's not very good drainage. Uh, it tends to hold water, but it doesn't really do anything with it. Uh, and then in addition to that, if, if it does dry out, it, it gets quite hard, uh, almost like a hard pan. So those, those are all no-nos in terms of uh, developing healthy grass, uh, healthy root systems on grass need to be, have air and actually most plants do so this isn't just uh, unusual to, to grass or to uh but the another thing that that'll happen is if you don't consider this uh then you know you could buy sod put sod in or, or do seed it'll it'll see it'll grow seemingly initially and do fine and then uh you start to get these faded patches that just don't because they're, it's not rooting out properly all right so that's an easy way to to see the, the bad news the way to avoid it is is pretty simple. It's to dig up the soil and in this and, and turn it over that you're literally uh, bringing air into the soil. You don't have to go very deep to do, I'd say like six inches. Um, and then if you amend the soil with a lighter, even a loam, uh, something like that, something that's not going to compact right up uh, very quickly again. You're not going to get a mushy, you know, squishy mess that's not what you're after. And, and, and you, you, you really don't have to worry about that too much. So if you have a, a, a little lawn area and you don't have a footpath, uh, uh, even a dog will pretty clear, will ruin it pretty quickly. Um, if, a big dog, I should say, not a little dog. But uh, if I don't know if I mentioned that earlier in the video, but just understand that uh, grass in small areas, um, you actually need to uh, give it a break. It's not like you can't have a party and, and have everybody stand on your lawn. But uh, if you're continuing to use it on a daily basis, uh, <clears throat> then you will need to give it a break just so that it can it can uh, get healthy again. In fact, uh, a lot of parks will cordon off areas that that where you know people like Central Park and stuff, where people all go out and mass and 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 sit and, uh, and then they you know if it's a condensed area that becomes a problem. So they make everybody get off and they put a ribbon around it and give it a week to uh to get better okay uh just remember that i think that's all i can say about soil aeration <laughs> if it's a really clay packed soil you're definitely going to need to aerate it once you've worked it and tilled it and you want to break down any chunks or clumps or clay or anything like that you want to remove any debris this is a good time to amend your soil and add uh, some organic matter 
The next thing you want to do um, after it's all been mixed together is to really focus on your grading. And this is a time when you could look very, you know, you could get down and just kind of get a sense for the natural grade. Once again, think about tapering down from your focal point to zero. All right, so ground zero is usually gonna be the lowest point of this turf area. So this is also the time to think about where you might improve drainage or encourage drainage to go this way or that way, right? Don't get emotionally attached to your trees. If you want your garden to look beautiful, this is one way to, to, to stop that from happening. We're gonna add trees, we're gonna add plant material. You know, cutting down a tree is not murdering mother nature. Um, it's, it's giving her more opportunity. Grass generally requires full sun. Full sun, for all intents and purposes, means four hours or greater. Certainly you can grow grass in areas that have, uh, have less sun than that. Typically that grass that's grown in shade is a little more delicate, doesn't root out and, and, and create that sort of dense carpet effect. So, so to put sod in successfully, you need to ideally buy, buy it straight off the farm. It's harvested in the morning, you put it in in the afternoon. That's the ideal scenario. Uh, we usually just rake the back uh, lightly and we'll moisten the, uh, the back of the sod and we'll put it in. You think that would be it, but no, no, no. <laughs> All right, so when you lay sod, you sew it together, right? And then we fill in the seams and, uh, and we staple it. We usually pound the seams in order to secure it. And we fill in the, all of the, the entire parameters so there's no exposed uh, edges. After you've got it in and stapled and sewn together and fit and cut, you also need to tamp it. I mean, if you look right down here, you can actually see where we sowed the sod and you'll see a little bit of soil in there too. If you really want to be careful about um, not losing your sod, that's an excellent method is to, is to sow in a little bit of soil at your seams. We have to remove any air pockets and that needs to be done in a, in a very methodical way, meaning you start one area and don't jump around and kind of like randomly tamp it. The whole thing needs to be tamped. Again, it's very unforgiving. So what we did on, on our property is we used a few different types of seed. Uh, we used the Kentucky bluegrass, uh, rye, and different different types of seed to kind of deal with the different circumstances. So you can't use the same uh, seed that you would use in deep shade for a full sun and, and vice versa, right? Um, I think most people know that. Um, the other thing is to when you're spreading the seed, you know, I think I might, might have mentioned, hopefully I'll, I'll say it one last time, is that you don't want to overspread it. So that's that's very important. Uh, there also is a seed that is a, a water, this is a, a probably Probably a Scots production, so I shouldn't produce, promote that. If I did, then forget about it. Uh, get the cheaper seed. Um, you can buy it in bulk from agriculture uh, ag aggie uh, stores and things like that um, at a much uh, 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 cheaper rate. But this, the Scots has a brand that uh, is a moisture has actually a coating on it that holds moisture. Okay, um, but that that's not necessary. Um, what is necessary, and probably the b better attitude <laughs> is, is to make sure that you're watering it. Does not need to be um, get a a, a heavy water. In fact, if you water too hard, you're going to get to, it'll it'll wash and things like that. So, uh, what you want is a consistent watering, and I, ideally, it'd be more like a mist. You know, that's going to be hard to do um, unless you have a, a, a you know a great sprinkler head and, or something like that. The main thing is to not let it run too long, but to do it consistently for about 10 days. Once it roots out, uh, after that, you know, you you're, you're you know unless you get uh, you need, oh, and you certainly have to do it and uh, at, during a specific time of year. This is a fact. Do not try to do uh, grow grass from seed in the middle of the summer. You will fail. Uh, what you want to do is uh, try to do it in, in, towards the end of the month. That's, I mean, the end of the summer or in the beginning, early, like now. May is perfect. Uh, September is perfect. All right. Uh, you know, the nights still need to be on the warm side. So, uh, can, it won't survive. The new, newly germinated seed will not survive a frost. Uh, so, so we have to take that into consideration. Removing all the pebbles or any debris that is on the surface. So what you want is the maximum amount of contact between the surf, ground surface and seed in order to encourage it to germinate. This is, um, seed does not get planted, right? We don't cover it with soil. The seed actually germinates by laying on top of the soil itself. 
All right. Of course, that presents a, a lots of other potential problems like a rainstorm. So one of the most common mistakes when doing grass seed is to pitch way too much. And essentially what that, it chokes itself out. You'll just have these big clumps that will, will look great at first and then quickly die off. It, it is a good idea to use a spreader. They're, they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, they even have handheld spreaders uh, rather than just trying to pitch it uh, by hand. But if you do pitch it by hand, just remember more is not necessarily better. We had a whole bunch of construction work done on our yard. My wife and I uh, hand seeded and prepped everything with a few shovels. She still loves me. Yes, about a half acre all by hand. All you need really is, is a timer, uh, obviously a hose, and a, and a cheap sprinkler, oscillating or whatever you want to call it. You don't want to water for too long. You just want to keep it moist. So you don't want any puddling. So what I did was I I, I bought like five timers and I splitters and you know ten hoses. I had a big area to do, but it worked actually. It came out really nice. I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you some pictures. It's not a bad idea to lightly hay on top of the seeds. This does actually does a couple things. It's not just to stop the birds from eating the seed, although I, obviously that helps. But it's also it helps keep the moisture in the ground. Let's say you're just one of these people who's definitely not going to go the grass route. That's cool. One of the main reasons people are interested in, in finding alternates to grass or lawns and things like that is because they require a lot of maintenance. Grass has to be cut, right? I think what happens, that creates an assumption that perennials don't require any maintenance, but they do. You know, compared to lawns, it's certainly low maintenance, but the difference between low maintenance and no maintenance is huge. There is no such thing as no maintenance when it comes to gardens. Some common ground covers you could use in shady areas, with, uh, just to name a few. Periwinkle, Pachysandra, Liriope, Ajuga, uh, Creeping Jenny, Sweet Woodruff, Crested Iris, and Sedge. Some full sun ground covers, Mazas, Creeping Thyme, Creeping Flock, Lamb's Ear. Instead of thinking of these types of ground covers the way you would turf or lawn, it's better to think of them in terms of a perennial garden. Think of your, your perennial garden the same way you thought about the, the grand design in terms of having different elevations and different growth habits. Your ground cover then would be in the foreground, right? So something like Creeping Thyme or Mazis or, or Creeping Jenny, any of those really low-lying mat-like ground covers would be in the foreground. And so behind that, you might have an area for your moss or a sweet woodruff or something like that. And then behind that, you could throw in like a taller iris or echinacea or some of these other perennials. A really well-designed perennial garden will have not only these, these different textures and different heights, just like the, the broader concept of our entire garden, but it'll also uh, offer different seasonal interest, right? So the echinacea come blooms later in the summer, the iris blooms a little earlier. So we get these different effects all happening at different times. Like one goes out, the other comes in. Liriope, we call we like to call it poop grass because it's really common in like uh, tree pits. The dogs like, like to use it. Uh, it's nice because you can't see the, their work. Uh, Liriope needs to be pruned in early March, right before it, it, uh, before it sends up its new shoots. If you don't do that, the old shoots uh, kind of turn brown on the edges and it looks really raggedy. So just remember that uh, the difference between low maintenance and no maintenance is huge. Um, so even though you, know, you don't have a lawn, uh, you, there is a little bit of maintenance. So cut back your Liriope before the new shoots. If you wait too long, that would be an even bigger problem because those you'll snip those big sh new sh fresh green shoots off. They look like, you know, like the like they, their arms got lopped off or something. Anyhow, okay, so that's Liriope. Uh, Pachysandra is another one. Now, Pachysandra is probably the easiest, most likely to grow successfully and, and create a dense ground cover. The problem with Pachysandra is maybe that it's just, it's, it's too aggressive. So you need to uh, prune that every year uh, in areas around your shrubs or it will, it will you know, come in and rob the roots of your other, other. Scottish moss um, is this beautiful lime green, little tuft of, uh, grass-like moss, right? And no matter what I've used it with, I noticed, you know, it, it had a dramatic effect. It's expensive, so I could only buy it in very small quantities. And then, some years later, I was traveling as a musician, as a performing songwriter, and driving through these mountains in northern England, and uh, going to a city in Scotland called uh, Edinburgh. Never been to this part of the world before. I'm, I'm, I'm wide-eyed and just looking in awe. 
at these beautiful mountains that were covered with everywhere with this lime green grass. I noticed there were stones everywhere too and the grass would just go right around them. So I, I couldn't take it anymore. I finally just pulled over and you know, the roads are narrow, it was dangerous, but I, I, and I jumped and I ran into the field, picked it up. And of course I realized this is not grass. This is Scottish moss. <laughs> Okay, so now that I've promoted uh, Scottish moss as like the best thing since sliced bread, um, I should say that you will probably never experience the kind of uh, positive results that they do in Scotland where it is native. Uh, in fact, I have tried and I've never been able to get it to grow uh, anything like that. Uh, it is a beautiful little addition, but in Scotland where it is native, it gets this perfect mix of uh, a, like a light mist every day and uh, just the right amount of sun. Uh, it doesn't get that radiant heat. <laughs> really I am nice. compelled to address the whole lawn issue uh, in, a, in a broader sense, okay? Um, there is a, uh, through uh, the, the interest in permaculture, a, a powerful movement towards uh, moving away from lawns. Um, the the problem is 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 complicated. All right. For starters, let's just go to Lyme disease, right? Uh, and if you looked at my uh, tick-free zone video, you you found out that the easiest way to get rid of ticks is to create a an area where the grass is all pretty low and uh, there's no like tall grasses because ticks can jump. Um, actually, they don't jump. I think they just kind of fall on people, and they do it very easily when you're surrounded by tall or grasses, shrubs, and things like that. So the whole idea of having a tick-free zone is to have, unfortunately, kind of a more manicured or, or, or tight uh, ground cover. So we do need a ground cover in order to be safe on our own properties. That's a fact. Um, now, um, you know, the problem is, is, is that it flies in the face of permaculture because permaculture is all about, uh, you know, working with the indigenous uh, species and plants. So if, if, if something turns to weeds, like it did in the High Line, uh, where they, they glorify the, weed, the weeds, right? and turn them into these uh, extraordinary, uh, this extraordinary park um, by, by taking advantage and understanding and appreciating them and nurturing them and all of that. Okay, so, so um, there's that. And then there's also, the, you know, this, uh, the, you know, we have right in, con you know, this is, I'm just showing you the depth of the conflict. Uh, we have noise pollution from lawnmowers. We have uh, 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 excessive use of fossil fuels. I mean, riding a mower for hours, right? And many, many of these things, like an, like an army, imagine an army of thousands thousands of mowers all going simultaneously around the country. I would, I would venture to say millions of lawnmowers running simultaneously on a daily basis. Imagine what that, what that means in terms of fossil fuels, fuels, all right, so so we have it, it, it's a deeper problem than than you than it looks to be on the surface. I mean, why just have why have grass, right? Uh, and there there's a radical reaction to it for good reason, uh, for for the reason I just said. And then the water consumption uh, that is actually the, the the biggest problem. So the water consumption, I think I already alluded to it in the beginning. Um, the numbers on this are staggering. Uh, it's something something like uh, eighty ninety dollars per person in the country uh, is spent on on gar on garden care and most of that uh, uh, the majority of that money is it goes towards lawns and I'm sure it's it's, it's the it's the wealthy um, you know I won't say the top one percent but it's 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 certainly the upper class problem you know um, but not just and and uh, so so th these this is so what I'm suggesting here is, is a gradual transformation I know this you know this kind of goes against my own instincts I'm kind of a an anarchist at heart you know uh, but um, and you know I, I do understand and appreciate that if we didn't uh, get if we didn't, uh, my wife has had Lyme disease, uh, and, and the, the real deal. And so, and, and like a rampant problem, an epidemic, okay? So we have to protect ourselves. That's one issue. The second issue is, <laughs> it's it's not just keep up with the Joneses. It's it's an intense amount of pressure um, to keep your, your yard looking manicured uh, for real estate values or whatever. Uh, we're already kind of, we have a lot of little projects around here. Our neighbors are a little bit weird <laughs> about some of what we do. I mean, they love us, I think. I, but that's, you know, so imagine if we didn't cut our grass, mat, we would have weeds everywhere. So there's that kind of like keep it looking good, you know, kind of thing that everybody expect. There's an expectation. Um, again, this all goes directly in the face of permaculture, um, you know, the waste of water, uh, a, a disrespect for the land, uh, a forcing uh, cultivation of a particular grass and things like that. Okay, so it's a complicated problem. Now, 
I, I need to also add to that on our property, we would have had major erosion problems. So I, all right, so let, let me get into the solution. The solution is to build gardens and they are doing this successfully in, in certain parts of the country, very uh, California in particular. Um, they've, they've done away with, they, they've limited the amount, they've literally made it impossible for people, people where there's a drought. You know, people are learning about what plants do well under drought conditions. Now here we don't have that, that's not the issue. Um, we, you know, we have plenty of water, we don't have to water our grass, uh, maybe, maybe a couple weeks in August. Uh, but um, we would have an erosion problem immediately uh, if we have a shale. So it's, a, that, you know, if you, if you just go about an inch underground and most of the surfaces were actually on a mountain, so to speak, everything here is, is, is stone. And then, you know, you, if, you did, if you put a shovel on the ground, the chances are you're gonna hit, uh, unless you're near a bog, you're gonna hit shale, okay? So it's very difficult for farming, for a lot of things. So, so that is the issue there. We need to uh, contend with it. That I needed to put as soon as I, I cleaned up this area, I had to put seed down immediately. All right. So um, now the last thing, you know, I, I, I do want to say there's a, a cosmetic thing that I love. So um, what I've tried to do is, is in my own gardens, is really promote it as a border. Okay. And you look at, at nurseries that are, you know, so my, my sister owns a beautiful nursery called uh, uh, Horsford's <laughs> in um, in Charlotte, uh, Vermont. You should check it out. Um, she has uh, limited grass, uh, you know, but she does have these little pathways between her, between her gardens. And I would do the same thing in your garden. I would look for ways to, uh, uh, to promote gardens that are, are, are separate. And, and, uh, and, and in other words, they are separated by uh, a patch of grass. Okay. That's the way I always like to phrase it. Cause it's very hard to beat that, though, to be honest. It's very hard to find something that would get this uniform. In other words, uh, um, all the ground covers that I mentioned, as much as I, I like each one of them, the truth is, in order to get them to be successful, I think the biggest one I've had success with is Mazis, but even that um, has been intermittent and difficult to control. So um, you can look for, uh, you can look at every ground cover there is out there, and I uh, wish you well. Certainly, like Pachysandra and things like that, where they're just very aggressive in shady areas and things like that, but you can't have a yard that's just Pachysandra, or can you? <laughs> so um, I encourage people to do other things besides grass. I am not here to promote lawn, um, but I am in the, in the, you know, in the beauty business up to an extent, and there's, a, there's a, that, and I contribute more to the environment than 99% of the people out there, in my view. Like, I'm planting trees, planting, uh, all types of plants, encouraging natives, doing work, you know, working for <laughs> Mother Earth on a daily basis, and I have my whole life, and I'm still doing this thing that I don't feel good about, all right? So, um, so, so uh, you need to work with me, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> and I need to work with you, right? I mean that. I mean that sincerely. Um, the permaculture uh, movement is, 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 is right. It is, it is not wrong. They are right. And so I'm, uh, I, 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 I aspire to live up to those ideals any way possible. And I move like these areas here, and I'm, I'm saying this little speech, you know, I'll get off my pulpit in a second, just to show you, to demonstrate what I've done here is, is create areas. My, my wife is doing this too. Uh, we'll have a, a big vegetable garden here shortly. Wonderful way, like it just is rewarding. And, and the context of a vegetable garden is always a cosmetic uh, uh, feel good, you know? So we never have a problem with, with a vegetable garden um, in terms of, it, does it look good? <laughs> All right. Um, enough said on that. Let me see if there's anything else I left out. Erosion, uh, lawns demonstrate seed, uh, bring in seed, uh, uh, add more barn parts, rename Malariope, uh, added text to the root perm, uh, add Scottish moss, cosmetic uh, person, uh, uh, 